Thank you for tuning in to today's webinar, Uncover True Genomic Heterogeneity, Getting Started with Single Cell Genomes, presented by Dr. Kamala Bahosin. Dr. Bahosin holds a PhD in microbiology and immunology from McGill University. She's a molecular biologist with expert knowledge and experience in assay development, nucleic acid amplification, and next generation sequencing. Her background includes expertise in molecular biology, microbiology, and host pathogen interaction. Kamala joined 10X Genomics in its early days and has worked on the development of various products, including Chromium Genome and Chromium Single Cell CNV Solutions. Without further ado, here is Dr. Kamala Bahosin. Thank you, Eric, and thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to be talking today about the tools that 10X Genomics have developed um, to study uh, genomic heterogeneity in cells. And in this webinar, we will be talking specifically about the single cell DNA tool and how it can be used uh, to profile copy number variations at the single cell level. So throughout this webinar, we're going to be talking about heterogeneity in complex systems, how it's present in uh, multiple systems, uh, including um, in cancer, and how it can be a driver. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the different approaches to study single cells and how a microfluidic approach uh, is a powerful approach because it can help you increase your throughput. And then we will be describing the 10x genomics chromium single cell CNV solution, going over the workflow, uh, giving some guidance on sample prep, on experimental planning. We'll talk about the tools that 10x provides to analyze the data that are uh, generated with this tool and how you can uh, use the tools to visualize uh, your data as well. And then we'll finish with a demonstration where we show the how we can use the single cell CNV solution to identify heterogeneity uh, in a uh, tumor derived from breast cancer. So as we know, cellular heterogeneity is, um, is uh, very present everywhere uh, and contrary to, contrary to uh, what it is thought that one mutation will just give rise to a new uh, cellular population, these mutations can happen at many, many levels, which means that a starting population can in, uh, evolve into containing uh, many different clones, as you can see here. Uh, in cancer, this is very prevalent and can be a problem because uh, you can see that as you start with a, a cancer cell that starts developing and, and multiplying, it starts accumulating different types of mutations. So your cancer uh, cell isn't really a clone, it's actually a population made out of a lot of different uh, clones. And so what happens is that uh, very often we can apply a treatment that can get rid of the majority of clones, but if there is a resistant clone that is hiding in this population, uh, this clone can be selected for and can eventually cause uh, relapse and, and escape the treatment. For this reason, it becomes very important to uh, determine the um, heterogeneity of the starting population, which can be very difficult when this clone is present in very low amounts. Uh, there are so the, the the heterogeneity has been understood for a long time, and there were a lot of tools that were developed um, to to study it, and they all have some uh, advantages and and disadvantages. So some of the tools are here, for example, uh, can be applied at the single cell resolution, uh, would be karyotype analysis and uh, fish so in situ hybridization. So they are tools that are, can be applied at the single cell level, and and the interpretation can be very easy. For example, in Stereotype. You can just uh, line up all your chromosomes, uh, count them, uh, look at their lengths and see if it makes sense. So you can see uh, big uh, aberrations in here. Uh, same thing with FISH. However, these tools offer you a relatively low resolution and most importantly, they're very low throughput. You're really looking cell by cell. So if you're looking to isolate a population that is present at 1 or 2% fraction, it's going to be very cumbersome to do it this way. Uh, some other tools that were uh, developed include RACGH and uh, microarrays and next-gen sequencing, so they will have better resolution um, and the, the workflows are relatively standard, so they're less cumbersome. However, these tools are bulk analysis, which means that, again, if you have a clone that is present at like 1 or 2 percent, it's going to be hard to identify because the, major, the bulk of the population is going to hide the differences that, that happen at the, at the single cell level or at the low uh, clonal fraction. So here the solution would be to be able to find a, a tool that combines both the resolution of detection and the possibility to study things at the single cell level so that you can entangle uh, all the, um, uh, the clonal heterogeneity in a population. 
So I'm going to talk here about uh, how microfluidic approaches can be uh, used for single cell studies. So suppose you start with a um, uh, oh, sorry. Suppose you start with a population of cells that is in your tube here. Uh, some ways to uh, study single cells would be to isolate them in uh, specific wells or micro wells. So to do uh, this, you're going to need as many wells or micro wells as, uh, as you have cells. So the throughput is relatively low because you are really going to have one cell per well. You need to process this in plates and it often requires cell sorting so that you can drop exactly one cell per well. Another way to study a cell population uh, is to use microfluidic partitioning. And what this means is that you are applying your single cell suspension onto, onto a microfluidic device that will essentially isolate or compartmentalize these cells in unique individual compartments that are shown in here and that are made of actually oil droplets. So what is really interesting here is that your oil droplet is there around a one nanoliter size. So in one tube of your strip tube, you can pack as many as thousands and thousands of cells there in one tube. So the processing is uh, massively parallel because you are building all of these libraries at the same time, as opposed to having these stacks of plates. So this is the basis of 10x genomics uh, chromium system. We have uh, different systems that can uh, study single cell or, or different analytes of single cells using microfluidic partitioning, including um, uh, transcriptomics and uh, epigenomics. But today I would like to talk to you about the single cell DNA solution. So this uh, solution is a high throughput system that allows you to profile copy number variations uh, of populations of cells and ranging from hundreds to thousands of cells. As I mentioned, it's a high throughput solution because you are analyzing all of those cells in one simple tube following one easy uh, workflow. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, it can be used to study the heterogeneity in cell population and uh, understand clonal evolution. Uh, the system is compatible with uh, a lot of different inputs as long as you have single cell or single nuclei suspension. So your inputs can be cell lines, primary cells, uh, fresh tissue, and nuclei derived from frozen tissue. So 10x uh, developed this very simple workflow to use with the system. You start with your input cells or nuclei uh, suspension. Uh, you can use the 10x kits that comes with fully um, uh, uh, functional reagents, uh, microfluidic chips, and the 10x instrument that will allow you to make your microfluidic suspensions. Uh, throughout following the workflow, you end up with uh, sequencing-ready libraries that you can run on your standard Illumina sequencer. And then 10x provides you the tools to analyze your data and to visualize it. Uh, and we will go through all of these things uh, separately. So first of all, before we dive into how the system works, I'd like to talk about uh, the, the challenge of analyzing the genomic content uh, of a cell at the single cell level. So we know that DNA is highly packaged, so it doesn't exist as a free double-stranded um, uh, form uh, in, in the cells, but rather it is heavily packaged around uh, histones and into chromatin um, so that uh, it can actually all fit in a cell. So it is actually a challenge because if you want to interrogate the DNA content, you need to find a way to make sure that you're making all of this DNA accessible and available to run your molecular assays on it. So the challenge, as I said, is that the DNA is heavily packaged. And when you do uh, treatments at the bulk level, you're going in and lysing cells, but the, 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 at the bulk level, if you have a cell population, all of this DNA content is getting mixed. If you want to study single cell, at the, if you want to study it at the single cell level, it's important to be able to unpackage the DNA, but you want to keep the cells separate from each other because you want to make sure that you're studying the genomic content of each cell separately. So in order to, or, um, uh, to, to solve this problem, 10x Genomics developed the cell beat technology. And uh, using this technology, we make sure that each cell undergoes sufficient lysis and make sure that the DNA is fully unpackaged before we go in with our molecular assays to study uh, the DNA at the single cell level. 
So 10x, uh, in developing the, the single cell DNA system, 10x decided to leverage the microfluidic system that uh, we currently have in order to create uh, this cell beat technology that is necessary to study DNA at the single cell level. So what is really important is that you want to isolate cells and make sure that their genomic content stays within the cell and doesn't get mixed with the genomic content of another cell. Uh, and in order to achieve that, we have developed a, a two-step microfluidic system. Uh, the first step uh, consists of, um, of a first chip that allows you to generate your cell beads. In order to generate your cell beads, you're mixing your cells with a cell matrix. And, uh, and upon mixing the matrix with a polymer, uh, the matrix and the polymer will, uh, will gelate together, will, will sit together and actually make, um, uh, turn into a solid gel. So by encapsulating your cell within your cell matrix and your polymer and encapsulating this again in uh, microfluidic droplets, you can allow these two to uh, the the polymer and the matrix to uh, to interact together and form a gel bead and your gel bead contains your cell which is why we call them cell beads so what's very interesting is that upon gelation these becomes a nice spherical shape and uh, what is very important is that they maintain their dna content inside the gel bead so the dna content of the first cell is not going to mix with the second cell and this is very important because when you want to do um, uh, parallel processing and you want to be studying all these cells in the same tube, you need to be sure that each cell is individually packaged. So what's interesting with the cell beads is that uh, they, as I said, they all contain the DNA of each individual uh, cell and you can now start lysing your cells and, um, and, and packaging the DNA to make it readily accessible for the molecular assay that you want to do. So once you have uh, measured, uh, sorry, when, once you have completely unpackaged your DNA and your cell beads are ready, you can apply them to the second chip of this two-step um, system. And in the second chip, what you're going to do is that you're going to be mixing those cell beads, which uh, uh, may contain a cell in each, with barcoded gel beads. And so what's really important here is that, again, because you are processing all these cells in the same tube, it's important that the DNA of each cell gets uh, uniquely tagged and marked and the way we do that is that we use a molecular barcode so all of the DNA is processed in the same tube but each cell gets a unique molecular barcode that makes sure that we can tell apart cell A found here from cell B when we're uh, doing sequencing later. So we generate what we call uh, gems or gel beads in emulsion and what is very specific to the single cell DNA system is that these gems contain two gel beads. They contain the cell bead and the gel bead. Uh, in your gem, um, uh, and it's very important that you make sure that, that, that the system was developed such that, um, such that a, uh, each cell bead, uh, each unique cell bead is mixed with one unique gel bead such that the barcode can be used to exactly tell what DNA was in this cell. So I'm showing you here a video of how uh, you can see the formation of droplets that contain exactly one cell bead and one gel bead on the screen here. Every barcode gel bead is this uh, light bead that you see in here and every bead that is grayish is a cell bead and it may or may not contain a cell. So you can see that it is a very deterministic microfluidic approach with which we're mixing them one by one. Okay, so you end up with this, um, you end up with a, an emulsion that contains, again, uh, droplets that have one cell bead, one gel bead. So upon generating this emulsion, you have mixed it also with everything that is necessary for your uh, molecular assay. Uh, there's, you have to, uh, so you, you're following your user guide going through the isothermal incubations during which the DNA will be uh, amplified and uh, barcodes will be attached. So now you end up with uh, all of this emulsion that contains barcoded DNA uh, that is all, that all has, contains a barcode specific for each cell. Then you could, once you have barcoded everything, everything, you can actually break this emulsion and mix all of this DNA together because now it has a, a unique molecular um, barcode that allows you to identify it when you're doing the sequencing. So by, uh, you, uh, by following the steps in the user guide, you can convert it into a sequencing-ready library that is readily uh, going onto your Illumina sequencer.
Uh, once you're done following all the steps, you end up with a library that contains um, uh, the following reads. So you have your P5 and P7 handles so that you can go into the Illumina sequencer. You have your read1 and your read2. And then uh, you can see that at the beginning of read1, you have the 10x barcode, which is 16 bases uh, that will allow you to uh, put together every read that comes from the same cell. Uh, to sequence single cell DNA libraries, we recommend uh, sequencing a configuration of 2 by 100 bases. However, you can go uh, lower than that and do 2 by 50 bases, or you can go longer if you're interested in, uh, in, um, in having more uh, genomic context. And uh, the, the libraries are compatible with, uh, the, with all of the Illumina sequencers uh, that are tested in here. So now I would like to go uh, a little bit about uh, some considerations uh, to keep in mind when you're doing experimental planning. Um, so the single cell DNA system is compatible with a variety of sample types. So as long as you have your single cell or single nucleus suspension, it's compatible with the system. So you can be using your cell cultures on it or primary cells. Uh, it's compatible with cells dissociated from fresh tissue, and it's also compatible with uh, nuclei extracting from, from flash frozen tissue. And actually, because the DNA content is found in the nucleus, the viability of cells isn't um, an absolute requisite for the system to work or to give the best performance. And because of that, the system is actually a system of choice to study uh, flash frozen tissues because the nuclei, um, extracted nuclei are actually a sample that is uh, fully compatible with the system. And we can go over this actually if you go on the 10x Genomics website uh, in the demonstrated protocols we have shown uh, we have uh, given an, a, um, a protocol for how to isolate nuclei uh, for single cell DNA sequencing so uh, it's, it's coming full with all the steps to follow and uh, recipes for your lysis buffers and everything without going into much details you can start with your tissue piece cut it into small pieces uh, add some lysis buffer and then uh, you can do how homogenization to extract the nuclei and upon simple centrifugation and wash steps you can determine your nuclei concentration and then you can run the system so you can go on the link uh, that is uh, shown at the bottom of the screen for for more details on that so now we're going to be talking about how you choose the right amount of sequencing for your experiment uh, so if you are interested in detecting copy number variations, it's important to understand that the resolution of the CNV that you can detect uh, will be directly uh, dependent on the amount of sequencing that you do per cell. This means that if you have a certain um, uh, if you have a certain amount of sequencing available, you need to know what is the kind of size of resolution the, the the kind of resolution of CNV that you are looking for, and this will allow you to determine how many cells to test. Alternatively, if you uh, know the resolution and you know how many cells you have to uh, how many cells you would like to test uh, based on your research hypothesis, then you can determine the amount of sequencing that you need. So in order to illustrate this we have um, a table here that can give you an example so for example say you have a certain amount of sequencing that is allocated to your experiment in this case it's uh, it would be 30x which is typical for a whole genome experiment uh, so 30x is uh, the equivalent of 450 million uh, paired end reads um, so if you have these 450 million, if you want to allocate it uh, on your uh, on the uh, different genomes of all of your single cells in your uh, in your um, in your sample, well, if you have a low number of cells, you will have a high number of reads per cell, and this actually will give you the best uh, CNV resolution. However, if you know that the kind of uh, copy of, uh, uh, variations or events that you're looking for are wider than that, for example, chromosome size or chromosome arm size, then uh, you know that maybe you don't need such a high resolution, so you can actually decrease the number of reads that you get per cell, which actually allows you to increase the number of cells that you can test in your system. So here, for example, if you know that you are satisfied with a CNV resolution of 3 or 4 megabytes, Bases, then you can uh, increase your experiment from going uh, just from 600 cells to going in the thousands of cells. And what's important to know is that uh, as you start uh, identifying copy number variations at the single cell level, you start trying to cluster them because you want to uh, put clones in the same cluster and start looking at the copy number variations in there. So the fact that you reduce the depth per cell 
makes it that uh, you will have um, makes it that the 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 resolution of the CNV at the cluster level uh, will be slightly lower. So to recap, uh, if you load more cells, it allows you to sample more of your population, but at a lower resolution. If you load less cells, it allows you to get more depth and to have a much higher resolution for your uh, copy number variation calling at the single cell level. Uh, for example, this is an example where we have run uh, this MKN49 gastric adenocarcinoma cell line, which is a cell line that has a, a ground truth where we could actually go and look for how well the copy number variations that are found in the cell line are being detected by, the, uh, by our algorithms. And you can see that uh, as you uh, run on the x-axis and, and you see how many reads you're allowing per cell, you see that as the number of reads per cell uh, gets higher, you're uh, completely plateaued at around a CNV resolution of 2. And you can see that as you start dropping the number of reads, your, your resolution is, uh, is uh, decreasing. Uh, but really, you can go all the way down to 200,000 and maybe even less, and, and you will still have the power to call the, the expected copy number variations uh, in this MKN cell line. So I'm going to touch upon quickly on the tools that uh, that 10x provides for you for your analysis and visualization. So we have gone already over how the reagents and chips allows you to generate your uh, your cell beads, your gems, and and to sequence to to construct your libraries. Then uh, 10x provides you with the with an analysis pipeline that will allow you to detect CNVs down to a few hundred KB for groups of cells and down to two megabases uh, for single cell. Again, if you are at the recommended sequencing depth of 750 and we will touch about uh, upon the visualization tool that uh, that 10x provides for you that allows you to uh, zoom into clusters of cells and and search for regions of interest so it, it, it's a nice um, uh, genome viewer where you can uh, survey your population of cells so uh, this quickly is a description of uh, the Cell Ranger DNA pipeline that uh, 10x uh, uh, provides you with the system. Uh, I'm going to go very quickly through uh, what the pipeline does for you. It'll bar so process the barcode so that it can actually identify which reads are coming from uh, which individual cell. It will align these barcodes to the reference and it will detect what is the cell and what is uh, and and uh, what are reads that are coming from cells. And then it's going to start binning read together and. and and determining what is the copy number variation uh, going on in, in your system. Once it has de determined this at the single cell level, it will perform some hierarchical clustering and aggregate uh, cells, uh, similar cells together, which will allow you to have these clusters where you can start now using the power of, uh, of, um, of clustering and combining those CNVs so that you can go at an even higher resolution. And the outputs of the pipeline are standard file formats. Uh, it'll give you a BAM file, IGDF5, and all sorts of uh, standard files, as well as uh, a loop single cell DNA uh, compatible file that you can use on the loop SCDNA browser. Uh, so the features and capabilities of our pipeline, it allows you to do joint analysis on multiple single cell libraries. So this is very interesting. If you're trying to profile a large number of cells, but you didn't run as many cells as you wanted, you can always go back and run more cells from the same sample and then uh, and then uh, aggregate all of these data sets together so that you have a super data set. It allows you to study heterogeneity across, um, for example, uh, if you are uh, looking at different sections from the same sample and you can track clonal evolution. So you also have some customized analysis options such as analyzing a subset of cells uh, of interest. Uh, you can create your own BAM file of clusters of cells or, and, and zoom in onto the individual cells that you are interested in. Um, before I go into the visualization tool, I'm going to show you how we can visualize the copy number variations on a color scale. So I would like to uh, take an example of a cell that has a, um, uh, that is a diploid cell and that has a what is considered as a normal um, uh, copy number of DNA. So each window you see here is a chromosome going from 1 to 22 in X and Y. And you can see here on the, X, uh, on the Y axis the copy number. If we want to visualize this copy number, instead of visualizing it as, uh, as a Y axis, we want to visualize it on a color scale. 
we create this color scale here where when you are at a copy number of two, uh, your window is gray. So what you can see here is that most of uh, my example cell here have a copy number of two across the whole genome, so it all displays in gray. It has no Y chromosome, so right away you see here that you have two X chromosome, no Y chromosome, so this would be a female. And you can see it here displayed where the Y is this deep blue. It means that it has zero copies. Another example is this MKN45 that I mentioned earlier, which is a cell line with a lot of copy number variations. And then you start seeing how MKN has regions that has copy number of two, some regions that has copy number of one. And here, if you display them on a heat map, you see that the region of two is displayed in uh, gray and the region of one is displayed in blue and so on. So it's interesting to visualize uh, on, uh, at this, um, uh, with this method because you can start visualizing the copy number variation over hundreds or thousands of cells just by looking at a heat map. So what we're looking at here is a, an in silico mix, oh, sorry, an, an, uh, an in vitro mixture of cells that was performed here in the lab at 10X where um, uh, 10 percent, uh, where there was a mixture of 10 percent MKN cells and 90 percent BJ diploid cells that were mixed together run through the system and you can see that uh, the way they display on your on your browser is that you have this small fraction and you can see how you readily identify the cells that are similar because they're uh, they're um, they're being clustered together for you uh, on the visualization. And you can see where here you have all these copy number variations, whereas here is the diploid cells and you see that it's all nice and gray. So 10X has developed this uh, visualization tool called single cell uh, uh, loop, uh, loop single cell DNA. Uh, and it allows you to load the file that you get from out of the, the pipeline analysis. And, and you can start actually visualizing your entire population just on your screen. So you can visualize CNVs across the genome of the individual cells, but it will also perform hierarchical cl clustering and, and group the cells into clones uh, based, on their, uh, based on the similar CNV profiles that they would have. Using the tool, it's uh, highly interactive. You can zoom into a cluster of cells uh, by, by clicking. You can zoom into specific genomic regions, which you can either scroll on your, uh, on your screen or determine by uh, entering coordinates on your uh, on your browser and so you can start really digging deep into your cells and seeing uh, seeing what's going on and then you can evaluate the metrics for CNV called either by uh, either per cell or per cluster so now I'm going to show you how uh, we can use the 10x single cell DNA system to study heterogeneity uh, in cancer. In this demonstration, we have taken a flash frozen piece of a triple negative breast uh, tumor cancer. The piece was sliced into five sections and each of the sections had 2000 cells analyzed in the single cell uh, CNV solution. So as an example here, by running 2,000 cells uh, of each, uh, so we run 2,000 cells of each section, and I'm going to be showing you here how section B looked as shown on the uh, visualization. So what you can see from these 2,000 cells is that right away you can see that you have a fraction of cells, around 40% here, that are fully deployed, okay? They're like uh, completely gray. Uh, and you can see that uh, that they are normal cells. And you see that there is uh, something like 60% of cells that have significantly different uh, copy number variations. And what's really interesting is that, at, like, just visually, you can tell how much uh, clonal diversity you can see in here. For example, you can see that the majority of clones here share this, um, uh, this copy number five of the uh, Q arm of chromosome one. However, you can see that at chromosome three, some clones have it at a copy number of three, and some clones have it at copy number of uh, four or five. So you can see that there are different clones in your population, and, and it's readily um, identifiable just by eye. Interestingly, if you had taken all these 2,000 cells and, and analyzed them in bulk, so not in single cell, you would get a, uh, a copy number profile similar to what's in here. So you wouldn't be able to tease apart all of these uh, nuances here and all of these differences in, uh, in the different clones that are present. So looking at all five sections, looking at all five sections from the tumor,
uh, it was very interesting to see that so here we're walking this is section a uh, b c and then uh, d and e are at the bottom it's very interesting to see how the amount of diploid cells was uh, steadily decreasing from the first section where you are here at the tip of the tumor all the way down to uh, to to the fifth section uh, you went from a diploid uh, proportion of 90 like pretty, uh, over 90 percent uh, going down all the way down to 18 percent and so this is really interesting because you can see that so we're cutting the tumor but you can see that the tumor fraction is changing depending on where you are on that uh, on that biopsy and then same thing you can see that each of the five sections have a different not only they each display heterogeneity but also you can see that the heterogeneity that they have is different from clone to clone so what was interesting to do was to see uh, what are the clones that are present and how are they represented across the five sections. So to further uh, determine the heterogeneity in these five sections, uh, we went ahead and pulled all of the tumor cells from these five sections and uh, lined them together in the same visualization. Uh, here we are um, we're looking at uh, sections of the the chromosomes that are showing the most variations from 3 to 10 so we can display them all together on the same visual and it allows us to see clusters and and to distinguish different uh, clones so we have called these clusters here from 1 to 7 and uh, they are and you can very clearly see them uh, on the, um, the they're displayed here on the left so we, are, we have clusters these cells based on the fact that they share uh, similar CNV profiles. And what's interesting is that you can see how these, um, how these clusters uh, relate to each other. So first of all, we can see at how these uh, clusters or clones are distributed across the five sections. So here you're seeing the five sections A to E, and you can see how much of the tumor or, or how much of the cell fraction is made out of these seven different uh, clusters or clones. And it's very interesting when you look at it because you can see that the clones are distributed uh, on the... Um, uh, uh, across the, um, the the spatial distribution of the tumor, you can see that the clones are distributed differently. For example, you can see at clone number seven here, you can see how it was barely present in section A, which had a low tumor fraction, but you can see that it's uh, steadily increasing uh, until it, it takes up uh, the uh, more than half of the tumor cells in section E. So you can see, for example, also how uh, clone number five is present in section B, but completely disappears from sections D and E. So by looking at this, it allows you to see how uh, not only how the clones are being distributed uh, differently in your tumor section, but you can also use some other uh, evolutionary analysis uh, tools to understand how these clones relate to each other. And by comparing them, you can see that, for example, clones 1 and 2 are very close to each other and very likely evolved very recently from each other, uh, and so do 6 and 7, but you can see that clones... Uh, uh, four, three, and five are actually distantly related, so they probably split out uh, much earlier. So by using this tool, you can not only look at uh, how, the, um, how your clones are distributed across your section, but you can also see how they relate to each other and, and, and how is their presence within the, the microenvironment of the tumor. So the key takeaways from this experiment is that you can reveal the tumor heterogeneity at scale. Uh, as I said, it would not be possible to do this if you were not looking at uh, the, the, the genomes at the single cell level. And obviously you can start uncovering how much variability there is, for example, in this case, in the subsections of the same tumor. And you can picture when a biopsy is being done, uh, depending on which section got biopsied, you can have different readouts. Uh, and, and this can actually impact the response uh, to treatment or resistance and, and, and the uh, effect of the presence of all of these clones uh, has to be explored, but will definitely be interesting tools to, uh, um, to, uh, to start thinking about uh, treatments. Um, and, and this also shows you how you can use single cell genomics to understand the clonal phylogeny within your own tumor, which would not be possible if you were sequencing these tumors in bulk and not at the single cell level. 
So I, I hope that you now have a clear idea of what the 10X genomic single cell uh, CNV solution is uh, capable to provide for your research. Uh, be sure to visit our website uh, to have more information. We have videos on how to that can actually guide you through uh, making your libraries. We have application notes and data sets that you can download and, um, and explore uh, to, to see how the tools can be used. Be sure to visit our support site and our, and our product page and you can reach out to us uh, if you have any questions or need help getting started. Finally, introducing uh, the challenge uh, that is jointly organized by 10X Genomics and GeneWiz if you are interested in trying out the single cell DNA for your project. Um, so this challenge here is, uh, is run by both companies. You can enter the challenge by submitting an abstract. If you have an idea, you want to do a pilot experiment, you think that this is the right tool for you and you would like to try it out. Uh, two winners will be selected. You have to enter before June 30th and and uh, two abstracts will be selected. They will receive a uh, complementary for reaction kit from 10X as well as support from GeneWiz to provide library prep, sequencing, as well as informatic support. So um, you can go on the website to join the challenge and hopefully your abstract will be selected and you will be able to test the tools uh, by yourself and see what it can do for your research. Thank you very much for being with us today and we can now take questions. Thanks, Dr. Behalstein. That was great. We're now going to move to the Q&A portion of this webinar. First question that came in, what is the maximum number of cells I can input per sample? How much will I need to have to try the experiment? Uh, yeah, so the number of cells that you want to input in the, in the system, uh, so the system is, um, is going to be able to handle up to 5,000 tested cells. So we have in the user guide, there's a table that tells you how many cells you can input if you want to test uh, a certain number of cells. And that number is, uh, as I said, the system is going to be uh, compatible with up to 5,000 tested cells. So depending on the concentration of your cell suspension and um, yeah, of your cell suspension, you can refer to the user guide and it's going to tell you how many cells you need to input at the beginning of the experiment. Another question. Can I detect somatic mutations or SNVs in my samples using your data? Um, yeah, so to be clear, this is a CNV assay. It was all designed to resolve the heterogeneity based on uh, differences in copy number variations between cells. Uh, you can use the CLV profiles to group cells together and identify clones. Uh, it, al it allows you to tell that these cells are all related to each other. And then you can start um, uh, using third-party tools to detect SNVs using the output from the assay. So specifically, we have uh, added a tool in our latest release, the 1.1 uh, of, um, of the analysis tool that is called uh, BAM Slicer. And this allows you to actually pull out your cells of interest, your cluster of interest, and then you can use your third-party tools uh, to start looking for SNVs. Just keep in mind that um, you will have some considerations uh, to keep in mind some considerations such as the number of cells and the depth you have per cell and the allele frequency of what you're looking for. If I only know about the CNV size that has been reported in the literature, how can I decide on the amount of sequencing if I don't know what CNV size? Yeah, so like we mentioned during the presentation, the CNV, the resolution of what you can detect will depend on the sequencing depth that you have. And if you're not sure what to expect, uh, you can always take your sample and do a low pass sequencing. This will allow you to survey um, uh, the level of heterogeneity in your system. You can see if there's something of interest. And then, and then once you see that your sample is actually uh, really interesting, you can go and sequence it deeper. And you can even then aggregate those two uh, sequencing runs together so that you can combine the depth from your first and your second run. Uh, and, and you can uh, uh, do more analysis uh, deeper. Uh, the other thing you can do is that you can use the size of your CNV in literature as a guide. 
uh, and this will give you power uh, to look at clones that are identified look, uh, using single cell data. Uh, and and what, what's really uh, the important and the added, uh, the, the, the power of the single cell data is that it's not like bulk where you can't really uh, stratify uh, uh, what's going on in your sample by looking at single cell. Again, you can get a clear idea of the heterogeneity that is present in your sample. If I have CMV output results from a primary tumor sample and a metastatized sample, can I combine data for analysis using your pipeline? Can I view the output together? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. Actually, we recently, with our latest release, we uh, released an aggregation feature with the pipeline, and this actually allows you to do just that. It allows you to combine data from different uh, samples and sequencing experiments together so that you can analyze it as one sample. And so this is really interesting because just like you're mentioning, you can see how your primary tumor and your, uh, and your metastasis uh, relate to each other, and you can also use uh, a similar tool to look at, for example, how is your uh, sample changing uh, pre-treatment versus post-treatment. And, and it's very interesting because you can keep following your clones of interest uh, and, and how, they get, how they are distributed between the different samples by putting them all together. And of course, the visualization will allow you to visualize the whole thing together. Another question. Is the data that you showed in your presentation available for download? And how can I download it? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, the, in the on the Ten X Genomics website, if you if you go uh, visit the page for the Ten uh, X Single Cell CNV solution, all of the literature uh, will be present in there. Uh, but also, if you want to rewatch some of the slides during this presentation, we have put uh, all the links uh, that are that will allow you to access this data. Uh, but yeah, everything is is available for uh, for downloading, and you can even try to play yourself with the data sets that are available. It looks like in the interest of time, we'll have to stop here today. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Kamala Bahosin for her presentation and all the attendees for joining us. If you'd like to watch this webinar again, the recording will be available at gmasweek.com. Also check out gmasweek.com for more activities, including webinars, exclusive promotions, multiple chances to win a total of $20,000 credit for GMAS services, and much more.